Welcome to the High Performance Hockey Podcast. Today, we're joined by strength and conditioning coach for the Utica Comets in the American Hockey League, Steve Nightingale. Steve is currently the head of strength and conditioning for the Comets. He previously worked as the strength and conditioning coach and sports scientist for the Kunlin Red Star in Beijing, China, in the KHL. He also provided services for the national and Olympic level athletes. He is currently pursuing his PhD at the University of Gloucestershire in England, where his focus is on external workloads in ice hockey. Fantastic conversation that we had with Steve. We want to discuss with him the challenges of coaching in a foreign environment in Beijing, China. Um, his article in the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research in 2013 titled The Usefulness and Reliability of Fitness Testing Protocols for Ice Hockey Players, a Literature Review, and his current PhD studies in external workload for ice hockey. It was a fantastic conversation. Grateful to have him join. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, Steve. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on. Uh, long, Already a long time listener. Yeah, happy to be on. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, I really appreciate that. I, I, it's very unique, uh, you know, reading your, your CV and, and where you've been in hockey. The first guest that we've interviewed that has had the experience of working in the KHL, you were in 2019, 2020 with the Kunlin Red Star. So you were in China. Yeah. Wow. Could you give us an <laughs> overview? How was that experience uh, from a broad-based question? And then I might uh, pick some questions out there further. But how was that experience? Yeah. So uh, just out of this world, wonderful, was, was the best thing I've ever done from, wow. a, from a professional, personal, everything standpoint. But actually, I went over to China in 2016 originally. So okay. I went over there for a contract with the female national hockey team program. And then I bounced around and had a couple of different contracts, some in hockey, some out of hockey, but always in, in elite sport. And then, yeah, ended up with Red Star, who are a Chinese-based team. And I say Chinese-based because when I was there, there were no Chinese athletes. <laughs> wow. So they were they were all n- nearly all North American. We had a couple of Europeans, but but you're in Beijing, but you're playing in the Russian league. So wow. you're getting all around the world. How I'd imagine the travel there was just absolutely crazy. 124,000 kilometers in the air in a season. <laughs> wow. So, so complete side question here. So we talk about this idea we've had in this, on the podcast, this managing versus developing. It's an idea I stole from Dan Pfaff, right? We develop mm-hmm. these qualities we're able to develop at times, maybe in season. And, and, and it's certainly uh, it, it's more of a managerial standpoint and managing stress during the season because of the demands of the game and com- uh, complementing versus competing. Walk me through a, a, a micro cycle or a meso cycle and, and a travel such as that. Yeah, it, it, it very, very challenging. And, and I'm sure I didn't do the best thing I could have ever done. I was as much of a zombie as everybody else in that time frame. What I would say for us, because we were, so you, the, the league is made up of six different countries. You have China, Russia, Latvia, Finland, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. We are, you know, Beijing's right on the east side of that. So you have Beijing and then the two Eastern European, uh, Eastern Russian teams. That meant that we would kind of do a homestand of six to eight games and then we'd go and travel for six to eight games. So wow. that wasn't too bad. And in terms of, you know, the physical development of players, it kind of wrote my periodization for me because sure. I, when we were at home and we had two weeks and I, we would get some better recovery and I had a nice gym. Okay. I can work on some qualities there versus a roadblock looks like, so let's, let's just, you know, you, you play a game in the evening, seven o'clock, whatever it is. So you play that game, finish the game, drive to the airport, fly to the next city land. You know, you've got two or three hour flight, two or three hour time change land. You go to the hotel, practice the following day. Okay then morning skate, then game, and then you do it all over again. So you just, it's just practice, play, practice, play, practice, play with flights and time changes in between every single time. And it's, 
awful. It's awful. It's absolutely yeah. awful. Like, like everybody is tired. Nobody knows what time of the day it is, what day of the week it is. I always say our guys just became conditioned to being tired all the time. Wow. I know some of the other teams, when they travel, they stay on their home time zone, sure. which is a great way to do things if you are only going for a short period of time. But with the Red Star, we would go for 10 to 14 days. You, there was no possible way you, you could stay on. It's crazy, on home right? time. The map is not the terrain. You can plan all you want, but when the real world smacks you on, you've got to learn mm. to pivot and things that you place value in are going to change in, in, on a scale, correct? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like I said, it was you know, you're just trying to get them to eat the right things. You're trying to get them to focus on whatever recovery that they can do, whether that was with our physical therapist or whether, you know, yeah. on the plane, what, what recovery modalities we can add in. And yeah, just, it was a very, very difficult time for everybody. Just curious. I know every team is very different, obviously in the KHL, what, as your time as a, as a performance coach, strength coach there, you know, how did that performance landscape look in the KHL compared to the National Hockey League or compared to college hockey? Behind, ahead, how did the performance department, how was it composed? So we had uh, a team doctor who was okay. who was Russian, really, really nice guy and went to a couple of Olympics as the doctor for Team Russia. We had a physiotherapist who is a fantastic, fantastic practitioner, Spanish guy. I'd worked wow. with him previously at the Olympic Committee when I was hired for Red Star, the first question I asked was, what are we doing about the, the therapy side? And they said, oh, we've, we've got a doctor. I said, no, nah, that's not going to cut it. We need, we need someone. So we brought, we brought him in, a uh, fantastic practitioner. Then there was myself. We had um, a masseuse, a team masseuse who was yep. a, a Russian. And that was pretty much it for, for the performance side of things. Okay. Interesting class of clash of cultures sometimes with the Russian sure. doctor. And I'm, and I'm, I know we'll get on to talking about culture because I bang on about it all the time, but yeah, some interesting clashes of culture there with him. But I would say our coaching staff and the playing staff were mostly North American. So that wasn't too much of an issue. Like where I've worked in Chinese teams that are truly Chinese, sure, you come up with some really difficult clashes there. Wow. And, and that is that is that more of a, a hierarchical top down? Is that what you're uh, suggesting in terms of those clashes? Absolutely. Uh, the way it was relayed to me by someone who spent a lot more time in China, another great performance coach. He said that the difference is as Europeans and as Americans, we're used to being kind of on a somewhat of a level with a coaching staff sure. on an even level. And you can have discussions back and forward. And and that's not how it works in China. The head coach is sits head and shoulders above everybody else. Ultimately, they will make every decision. And if they don't want to do what you're recommending, <laughs> they're not going to do it. So sure. a very different, uh, you have to kind of understand where you fit into that system. And it's different. It's interesting. Uh, we had the opportunity to speak to Dan Pfaff about his experience uh, coaching abroad as well. And he mm -hmm. specifically brought up China and said, that, you know, in terms and measures of um, communication and being able to build a culture, certainly he said it posed at times difficult for him. He also talked about this idea, regardless of where you're coaching, and it seems like this happened in China, the gatekeepers, gatekeepers. We talk about this idea. It, you could have the, 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 the prettiest tracking system, metrics, whatever it may be, but if you don't have buy-in by the gatekeepers, it really doesn't matter, does it? I mean, you're collecting data and you're not having it being applied in practice because there's no value in it. Yeah, certainly that's the case. A lot of the, so it's just, I guess, to go back a step, certainly from my experience, the head coaches are former athletes. Sure. The way people in China become successful athletes is they, it's almost like a sports school kind of system where at a very young age, they are, their education gets almost pushed to one side and okay. they are fully focused on, on sport. What that creates is coaches who have a very limited level of education. Sure. 
And what they then tend to do is do what was done to them. And they just perpetuate that cycle all the time. So sure. when you're trying to explain things to them, like they can feel very challenged and they then default and go, no, 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 this has always worked for us in the past. And come on, China have won hundreds of Olympic gold medals. Sure. They, they do. They are successful. Sure. I don't agree with the methods they use, but they are successful. But so, it, you know, there's so many issues in terms of, of navigating that landscape. That, sure. that make it very challenging. And I was there for four years. I feel like I did a, a better job than a lot of people and probably not as good a job as a lot of other people. Yeah. You, I fit <laughs> yeah, somewhere well in the middle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, it, it, very, very challenging and made me reflect on practice a lot, a speaking, huge amount. Speaking of reflecting, give us, if you could, the listener, what, what, were, what were some of the lessons that you took away, both positive and negative, that you're now using or are not using in your current appointment right now in Utica in the American Hockey League? The biggest thing is an appreciation of culture. And, and I, people who have listened to me speak before will know I talk about culture a lot. And, you know, I'm lucky I'm European. We, I've traveled a lot as a, as, a, as a child and been to different countries, but there's a difference of living somewhere for a long period of time. Sure. And, and, and actually just to, make a recommendation i was given a book by somebody called erin mayer and it's called the culture map and okay. i recommend that to anybody because it's a fantastic written book that that opens your eyes we'll we'll attach that to the show notes the culture yeah. map you said the culture map yeah okay for me this was this was kind of what the books how the book spoke to me was you don't understand culture exists like it is it's just what you do the way you think is the same way that your family thinks and the same way that your friends think. And yeah. that's just what it is. That's how you're raised, right? Sure. And I'm not talking kind of political leaning. I'm talking like how you navigate the landscape of human interaction, how one person converses with another one. It's body language, it's social boundaries, it's timekeeping. You don't realize that there is a different way. And Different because different presents as wrong, right? You just think, oh, they're doing it wrong. And it's like you have to get that appreciation of maybe different isn't wrong. It's just different. Yeah, absolutely. Based on experiences, based on yeah, based, yeah. 100%. Yeah. So, so that was the thing for me was when you see, like, it's so easy to see something that you don't agree with and shut it down and just go, they're stupid. They don't know what they're doing. And I really pushed myself to be uncomfortable to go, well, let's look at the context of that. Let's look at the story behind that. Why? And, and this could be from somebody doing an exercise in the gym to the way somebody is speaking to somebody else. Why, why is that acceptable here that it isn't acceptable somewhere else and, and all of that? So, yeah, really kind of a couple of years of blowing my mind of just like really thinking I'm a very small speck on a very big planet huh. and lots of people think in very different yeah. ways. And, so, I, and I'm not right in so, most of the ways. So well put. And I want to piggyback it off more of a comment than a question. There was a book that was recommended um, by Stu McMillan called Liminal Thinking. I don't know if you had the opportunity to read that book. Very similar. And I use it in presentations quite a bit. They reference, you know, the, this, this idea of the, um, the blindfolded men touching an elephant and everyone asking them what, what they felt, sure. right? And yeah. everyone's yeah. got their blindfolds on. There, someone's rubbing the ear. It's a carpet. Someone's rubbing the tail. It's a hose. And mm -hmm. everybody, uh, uh, you know, once they take their blindfold off or communicates has a different, you know, the goal is to try to slowly take the blindfold off through communication and understanding the reality mm -hmm. is based on experience, everybody has bias, even regardless, whether it's academia, whether it's coaching, whether it's whatever it may be, we have these biases and there's more than one way of doing things. Five plus mm -hmm. two is seven, you know, so is three plus four. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, there's a good, I, I used to have a, an image when, when we would have staff come to China, I, I ran a project for a year that, that brought like a hundred foreigners to come into China and disseminate them across and i had a slide that was two people looking at what looked like railway sleeper 
yep. block, you know, blocks of wood on the ground. And, and just the way it was an optical illusion. And from where one guy was looking at it, it looked like there was three of them. And where the other yep. guy's looking at it, it looks like there's four. And both are right, but both yep. are wrong at the same time. And it's that. It's like you need to get this idea that not everything that you think is right is actually right. Yep. It, yeah, it's interesting. Very interesting. Want to pivot here. I want to chat with you uh, about an article that you co-authored, The Usefulness and Reliability of Fitness Testing Protocols for Ice Hockey Players, a Literature Review. First came across the article actually when I was writing on a blog post of mine uh, regarding the, the NHL Combine, and I thought it was extremely well written, a lot of, lot of information in here. Could you give the listener kind of a, a, a footnote version of what the article encompasses, and then I'll kind of pick some questions out of there and we'll, we'll, go, with, we'll go ahead. Sure. Let me prefix this first of all sure. as well. So firstly, it was written back in 2013. You know, I've read both your books. I think they're fantastic. Let, you know, you and I both understand when you put something down on paper out into the, to the world, for me personally, that's a scary thing to do. And I think it leaves you very vulnerable because it's there now. Anybody can come back to that. Uh, you can't take it back once it's out there. And, and I, so I guess what I'm saying is I reserve the right to change my mind on things I've written in the past. Yeah. So well said. I, I, I feel the same way, quite frankly. You know, even with the books, uh, you know, like you're like, oh, man, I, I didn't think that way. Even a year, you know, even a month ago at times, yeah. Socrates never wrote his ideas because he was worried that someone would call him in the future because for changing his mind, it was always verbal. So I didn't want to interject with you, but I feel the same way when it comes to that stuff. You have the right to change your mind and there's always a different way. I would be concerned if I still thought the same now as I did five years ago. Absolutely. And if I think the same way in five years, I'm probably going to be concerned. So yeah, so I reserve the right to change my mind. But that being said, sure, I wrote this article and it's, it's essentially, I've often... I've looked at, uh, you know, the combine and just thought, this is nonsense. Yep. You know, at some, at some stage, it was a 68.2 kilogram timed bench press on a beep for everyone. Whether you're a six foot seven, 250 pound defenseman or a five foot 10, 180 pound forward, like, we, you know, we both understand the concepts of validity and reliability like that's nonsense it's complete nonsense so i started getting in, interested in that and i have a bit of a background in statistics so i kind of again those ideas of validity and, and reliability interest me so sure. just started to to have a look at well are these tests useful and i think it was it was a it was around this time and now forgive me because i can't remember which player it was but do you remember there was a huge furore about a player who went to the combine and couldn't do a pull up. I know exactly who you're talking about, and it's escaping my. Is it Sam Bennett? Does that sound right? I, I can't. Uh, I honestly I, can't remember. Yeah. But went on to to is a great player. Yeah. And it was just the idea of like, what what are we doing? Why is there yeah. any value in this? And also, just on that side note, like I combine testing is alien to me. I'm English. We sure. have a, a completely different approach to signing professional athletes we don't have uh like the university scholarship system we don't have drafts it doesn't work like that so it's completely different over here so oh, wow. that to me i'm like i'm i'm already looking at this from an outsider's perspective and my outsider's perspective is this doesn't make any sense so yeah so i just started to to look at what is realistic what what is useful what isn't useful yeah. um ended up concluding with a bunch of tests that I think are more appropriate for, for hockey testing. And, and what I would say on that is what I liked when Joel was speaking uh, on the last episode was he, he mentioned like fitness testing being situational. And okay. I agree a hundred percent just because I wrote those tests down eight years ago. I don't think I actually use any of those tests anymore. Sure. I'm not saying that they're bad tests, but, situations dictate that maybe other things need to happen. Absolutely. Uh, what, uh, if you don't mind sharing with the listeners, what mm. were the tests that you recommended at the time? Oh, now, now you're testing me without having looked back at the article. Uh, it was shorter and longer on ice sprints. Sure. 
It was the cornering S test for agility, yeah. which I still love, actually. I, I really good, like that, that test. I really like that test, too. Yeah. Yeah, I do like that test. There was, I want to say, one rep max bench and squat, which I, which now looking back, I just yeah. can't believe I ever recommended that to anyone because I'm so far away from that sure. now. Body composition stuff, which is is kind of fairly standard and, and stick with. I recommended the uh, Martin Boucher's thirty fifteen on ice intermittent yep. test. Yeah. Uh, which again, I think so, that's a great test. There's no issue with that. I yep. wouldn't do it in a pro hockey team just for situational restraints or constraints. But yeah, so I think that was about everything that I went through. Maybe uh, maybe it had counter movement jumps in there as well. Yeah, you know, I had a big aha moment for me in the combine uh, in terms of my opinion as well. I had an opportunity to, to interview Reg Grant. What an unbelievable, oh, hum- what great an unbelievable human being. Uh, I just, I just literally, the whole interview was just, my mouth was agape and I'm like, wow, what a, what a, first of all, what a classy person, what a mm-hmm. great man. And then second of all, wow, s- some serious knowledge. And at the time, forgive me, it's now SCAF, but I think it was the, he was the president of the, the, the strength and conditioning association of professional hockey. And I, I'm butchering that. And in it, he was, his responsibility, one of his responsibilities with several of his colleagues was designing the, the combine. And I asked him mm-hmm. the question, I said, well, help me give me an elevator pitch for what the combine is. I thought it was beautifully worded and I'm putting words in his mouth, but essentially he said, Anthony, we're, we, we're, we're asking the wrong questions. The, the goal here is not, is this the best hockey player? The goal is we know from goals, assists, plus minus, whatever metric you want to use on the ice, the kind of player there, the goal is to get an opportunity to see the player off the ice, maturity level, compete level, understand his character or her character. Are they prepared for that test? You know, and also he mentioned the fact that a lot of the the testing is driven by management and upper end management, which that really is hard for strength coaches or performance professionals to steer in terms and measures of changing the mm-hmm. actual events in the combine. Yeah, and and like you said, when you put it like that, I don't. I'm not anti combine. I'm sure. definitely not anti fitness testing. I just think we need to be very cognizant of why we're doing those tests and if that's the reason great yep. if you want to have a battery of tests because you want to see how gutsy somebody is perfect but then don't judge them if they come in and put the gutsiest performance you've ever seen but their number is low don't say they're bad at the test it's it's so true and, and it depends too the way you look at things right like uh, i don't know who it was that did the the, the one pull up i don't know i, mm. I don't and, and matter of fact i don't want to mention the name I, I think i said the athlete before and i don't know if that was him or not but it depends mm. which way you look at it too right hey he didn't do a pull up guess what he's one of the best hockey players in the world and that's a huge tank suv on empty that we can get a lot of progress and potential from so you you got to look yeah. at how you view these the, these tests as well yeah, the other thing to that, which I'll just mention, because I know it's it's I wrote this in the article. So there is a correlation between pull-up strength and 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 speed on ice. Mm-hmm. That's nonsense. Complete nonsense. What it means is that somebody who likes to work out is pretty athletic. Sure, but okay, like that makes yeah. sense. But keeping that idea that correlation doesn't equal causation and so you know like you said it's is there is there value in the test there's value in it depending on how you're looking at it sure if you know if you want to get everybody and you want to rank everybody and say this is our most fit player but actually we don't really care about what the scores are because we just want to see if somebody comes in prepared and if somebody puts in effort I don't know. You're kind of measuring apples and oranges there a little bit. I'm going to ask another question. Like we don't live in utopia. We live in the real world. And and those metrics are driven by many, many factors. Gatekeepers. We mentioned managers Mm -hmm. and coaches. We mentioned logistics. Hey, great. It's awesome that you'd want an on ice test, but guess what? There might be, you know, how many hundreds of people that that come into the combine every year? Like we might not logistically, it might be a mess, right? Yeah. My question is this. Knowing what you know now, and you again, you, you mentioned that you had the right to change your mind. Knowing what you know now, what would your utopian combine look like? Um, and, and when I say utopian, I, I, I mean, 
This can be as detailed or maybe two or three exercises. I'm, I'm going to give you my thought process and I don't want to frame it. Mm. But for my thought process, it would be okay. How much narrative can I get to managers without crushing an athlete? So what are my strongest correlates to skating ability off the ice? Those are, those are going to be my buckets that I want to, I want to see. So from there, okay, how can I, I rank or look at a player in terms of acceleration? some sort of uh, um, um, cornering or change of direction. And then, and this, this might be the distant third, and what would my conditioning look like on the ice? And that would be my battery. It, it wouldn't be like, my off-ice battery would look like my hairline, kind of bald. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both, brother. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't have a ton of tests. So I, I'm, I didn't want to give you my answer to frame it, but you have more experience on ice testing than myself. I run a private facility. We don't, I, I wish we selfishly did do a lot more on ice testing, but my question to you would be in a utopian world, knowing what you knew now, how would you, how would that narrative change? Yeah, I, I think simple is best. Okay. I would go somewhere along the lines of, and, and uh, let me pick up physiological capacities or capabilities, strength, power, agility, change of direction, anaerobic capacity, aerobic capacity, okay. those five things. You okay. need five tests. Now, are they done on ice? Are they done off ice? You know, there are arguments for both. You can see sprinting, like off ice sprinting and on ice skating are highly correlated. Obviously, yep. that kind of makes sense. I guess the thing is, and I, I, I might put myself out here on terms of Mike Boyle levels of contrary right now <laughs> not yeah. to offend Mike because yeah, yeah. I think he's a yeah. great guy I am moving more away from an idea of fitness test yeah I, I I really question but not because of, not because I have an issue with fitness testing but I question the value of what we do with that information <laughs> you know right. what is the point of testing somebody once a year and never looking at that information again versus what we currently do, and I'm sure we might get on to talking about what we do here with, in Utica and align with New Jersey, but we, we monitor stuff week on week. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that information is so much richer, so yep. much more descriptive than anything that you can tell me about testing once a year and, and never looking at that information again. Sure, sure. No, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Let's get right into that. Uh, I want to kind of weave our conversation mm. right now. What you're doing, we talk about this idea of, and you correct me if I'm wrong with my thought process here. Training is testing. Testing is training, right? You're being mm -hmm. able to pick yep. up your key performance indicators, your anchor points while the athletes are working. What are your big rocks in terms of what you're looking at during the entire uh, course of the season? And, 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 and to piggyback that, after you give me your big rock, what's the application? So how is that communicated to the athlete and how do you apply that in practice? Mm. Power is my one huge rock that I'll push down a hill. And we monitor that a lot through, again, this, I, I like this idea, training is testing, testing is training. So once a week, we RFE yep. and we do that at a set percentage of body weight which that percentage number is going to stay the same across the year and we look at we use velocity-based training and we look yep. at how fast they're moving okay single leg left to right gives me a lot of in interesting information i can look at asymmetries i can look at you know the speed at which they're moving and make an idea about how powerful that athlete is and also how successful is my training being because i i use weekly or bi-weekly monitoring to hold myself accountable. Yeah. What else is the point? Who else cares about this stuff? Yeah. Am I doing the right thing? So, so yeah. So, so we do that. We do a lot of jump testing. I don't think I'm giving away any huge secrets that anyone sure. going to be mad at. You know, yeah. everybody does jump testing. So we do that. And one of the tests I've done for a long time, I did it in the KHL, and I and I do it here as well. Is the six second watt bike test. Okay. So just just all out uh, looking at mean power, peak power and then relative values of those. So if I can keep a track on those guys and, and realistically, those numbers go up and down sure. all throughout the year. Okay, sure. some guys have great weeks, some guys, they're not great. Sometimes they bounce back, whatever. But again, it's, it's something that holds me accountable in my training. 
Yep. The athletes take a great amount of accountability for those numbers. And, and I've had conversations, you know, down the years with athletes where they've had a bad score and I've gone, okay, is there something, you know, is there something going on? What's the red flag? Where's the injury? And they're like, no, honestly, I just haven't been applying myself particularly well. And that's a great, like, kick in the ass for me to, yep. to do something about it. So I find that really good. How was that communicated to the athlete or are they, are they getting their, a player card? Is it an email? Is it, is it, how is the communication disseminated and then, and what's the narrative? So it, it's actually, I, I love it, especially I'll take the RFEs as an example. So we have, we use gym awares, yep. have two iPads in the gym and, and, and the guys are so bought in to A, their own score, but also just hyping up other people to get great scores, yeah. that they're crowded around the iPads, just like pushing each other to be like, oh, 1.74, come on, let's go. Like, Isn't that a beautiful, a beautiful consequence of using linear position transducers, just more yeah. objective, get the guys buying in and competing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and But what I would say is there is a double-edged sword at play a little Okay. For me, because so for example, we jump on a game day. Yep. Okay. The counter movement jumps. We have bar, four stacks. And some of those players want to know their scores each time. Some of them yep. don't want to know. Yep. Yep. And I've gone back and forth with my personal philosophy of do you tell them, do you not? And and the way I fall on that is it's their information. If Good they time. want my information, I'm never going to withhold that from them because that's how you lose buy-in. Mm -hmm. But what worries me, and I've seen this in, in players up and down the years, is they have a bad test and now it's in their head. And actually, I had a, a conversation around this with a couple of the players who I won't mention the brand, but they were wearing a recovery garment yep. instrument. And they said, I'd wake up in the morning feeling good. And then I check the app on my phone and it tells me my sleep was terrible and I'm instantly, I feel terrible. How it's much information is too much? It's, it's one of the reasons actually, I know it's not a perfect scenario. We're, we're in a much smaller scale than the private scale, but we stopped with some of that because of that. Mm -hmm. Almost this idea of nocebo, right? Like you, you're almost intentionally not feeling well because you're looking at a score. Meanwhile, yeah. the athlete feels a, you know fantastic, perhaps just an RPE or, hey, how'd you sleep this morning? I know that's not rocket bulletproof, but I don't know. There's, there's something at the end of it that where I, I, I do feel there's, even in the best of times, we're subjective, but just a simple wellness questionnaire, I think, can work wonders. Mm. But yeah, yeah. And, and so, so to kind of answer the question of how I give information back, it's verbal. Sure. And it's, and it's verbal if the athlete wants to know A, their score, and if they want some context around their score. Because, you know, a guy can come in, I go, great, your jump was... 42 and he's like okay yeah what, what does that mean um you know so so sometimes they like i said some people don't want to know at all some people want to know how are they doing what's that in relation to their average so, and it's, it's normally just a conversation and then all of our weekly kind of monitoring stuff that gets reported back to coaching staff and our no. development team and that sort of thing so and then they they basically the way i report back that back is just a percentage difference from the last time. Got it. So you're going to see percentage inc performance decrements or increases based on week to week. Yeah. And, and, and again, I try and give that a little bit of context if I feel like it's needed. Maybe we had two games one week and then we have four games the next week. So, sure. Okay. What are we expecting to see? And sometimes it's an individual player. And I was like, okay, so these were the scores and yep. this is the context around the scores. Is it just individual values or do you weight certain, uh, you know, uh, for example, you have a power weight, you know, whether it's vertical jump or, or do you do weighted scores or is it just simple, you know, individualized no. metrics that you track over time? Yeah. So it's, so each one's a, a discrete metric. So that right. report would, that would go to a coach will have the, the player's name and then it will have their percentage change. For the RFE, you'll have their percentage yep. change for their six second bike test, percentage change for their cat movement jump. Got it. And then we have some stuff around workloads, obviously, which I know we're going to get yep. into 
yeah. uh, at some point because it seems to be all hey, I ever hey, talk hey, about. <laughs> hey, you're actually reading my mind. Let's let's, let's pivot right there. So <laughs> I've I, done I'm a few podcasts. I know how they go. <laughs> I butcher this so I, I, off air. So I'm going to try to do my best here. University of Gloucestershire. We'll go with that yeah. wasn't bad. Gloucestershire, <laughs> you're giving, that wasn't you're bad. making me feel good. <laughs> PhD and uh, you're focusing on external workload. First and foremost, let me ask a, a, an unrelated question, but it's obviously related to your PhD. How are you juggling your PhD life with your work? <laughs> and I can speak as a as a as a, a yeah. former PhD. Oh my gosh, I I I, I think. You are a very driven individual. Anyone that's gone through that journey, I have the utmost respect for. That's all I can say. A hundred percent agree. Anybody who's come out the other end, like it's tough. It's tough and everything seems to take a lot longer than you think it will. And, you know, especially like high performance sport, there's always a demand on my time somewhere. Sure. So yeah, just you just have to find time and pockets of time. And, and honestly, like, I could go three months without looking at anything to do with, with the, the actual PhD itself. Yep. And then I'll have a good couple of weeks where I really get on. I, just before, literally just before the, this call, I was on a call with my supervisor about something. So, but yeah, so like we, we, we touch base uh, fairly regularly just to kind of have a catch up. But yeah, it's, it's sporadic, I would say, yeah. just as and when time allows. It, but yeah, they're challenging to get done. Well, congratulations. I'm telling you, that's a, a massive feat. Just uh, I, I think uh, from looking back at my experience, uh, I, I don't necessarily think it's the smartest uh, that get PhDs. I think it's the most, res I think resiliency has to be the, I mean, I, one of my friends told me regarding papers and completion of a paper, he said the most frustrating part is you don't get to decide when that paper is done. <laughs> yeah meanwhile it's the hundredth revision <laughs> oh, oh i've been through a, a few of those before yeah yeah for sure talk to me about the concentration of your phd mm -hmm. external load so let me first start by asking what is external load I, i'd like your definition of what external load is mm. okay my definition is an objective measure of how much work a player has completed and I thought about that and I, cause I obviously we talked before about questions. I thought about that and I'm very conscious of the language that I use in that because it's not stress. It's an external measure. It's outside of the athlete. What we're doing is putting a box on somebody's back and looking at how quickly that box moves around. Sure. It isn't the response of the athlete to that box. So that's when you need to bring in internal measures and stuff like that. But yeah, there you go. An objective measure of how much work a player has completed. Explain to me the application right now in the real world setting of what you're doing in terms of measuring of quantifying and measuring external load. Mm. So I guess just to, you know, a little bit of, of background. So people here at Sound Low, they think GPS. Everybody thinks GPS. Not wrong, but also not right, okay. um, depending on the setting that you're in. So GPS works with satellites that are in the sky. They can't, they don't go through roofs, they don't work in the ice rinks. So you can then they have a system called an LPS local positioning system, which recreates that hardwired into a building. Very, very expensive. The third option is what we call in inertial measurement units, IMUs. Okay, IMUs, yep. Yeah, yeah um, which is a scaled down version. Now, the difference between all of them is if you're using a GPS or an LPS, you can track additional metrics. You can get uh, speed, velocity, distance traveled, things like that. When you're solely using the IMU measurement, you're looking at the forces that are acting on that piece of equipment so you okay. it's great you can look at this the triaxial accelerometers magnetometers and gyroscopes so you can look at you know the three axes how much they're being moved and the magnitude at which they're being moved and okay. then you can draw some some inferences from that so again the the lps and the imu What's the major difference between the two? Educate me again. I apologize. Sure. No problem. So an, an LPS system, a local positioning system, 
requires hardwired sensors around an arena, yep. which, which replace a satellite up into the sky. So mm-hmm. with an LPS system, you can get a measurement of velocity. You can get a measurement of the distance that somebody is traveling. Okay. And you don't get those measurements with an IMU system because an, an IMU unit isn't talking to anything else. It's, it's like I said, it's these three gyroscope, magnetometer, accelerometer, case, you know, it's essentially your sure. phone is the same thing. Sure. It's just a, it's just a really, really fancy version of your phone GPS. Got it. Learn something new every day. So explain to, to us the application here. Uh, obviously we're tracking external loads. You said LPS is extremely expensive. So I'd imagine mm. at the national hockey league level level that is LPS or, or is it, I, varies. It, it, it just varies. It varies. Yeah. Okay. On, on club to club. And we're talking tens of thousands of sure. dollars a season for these, for these pieces of equipment. So they are expensive and it does vary in, in the NHL. I know some clubs have LPS systems. I know some clubs use IMU systems. Got it. So how is this being used in your current setting? Is it just for practice? Are athletes engaged in wearing these in games? How is the, the I know, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, NHL, they're not wearing wearables during games, correct? It was just preseason. Yeah, so that's correct. AHL doesn't have that sort of CBA in, induced rule, so we can wear ours in games. KHL was the same. They could wear them in games. So you get a, a wealth of more sure. information. I I don't work in the NHL, obviously. I'm in sure. the American League, so I wouldn't know the exact wording of whether players can opt in to wear them if they choose. I don't know. Sure. I don't know if they're banned, particularly, or whether the, it's a player's option and, and a club can't force you to wear one. I, I wouldn't know because I don't work in the NHL. As sure. much as I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> How are you using this to make decisions? Obviously, I'd imagine that the players are wearing them during practice. I know probably a select mm-hmm. few of them would be wearing them during a game if they'd like. So maybe a better question to ask would be, from your experience using this, what do you feel are the most important measure metrics to measure and why? Mm. So with our team, with the American League team, actually, all of our players wear them in all practices and all games. Wow. That's yeah. great. And the buy-in has been fantastic. We we just, just as a side note, the group of players I work with are fantastic. Absolutely awesome. And a side note real quick, because you have experience with this, but I'm just speaking, uh, you know, just in the, the difference between practice and games. I think it's so critical to be wearing them during games. If the athlete chooses, right? Because again, depending on who's your coach, depending on the practice, but there's a difference uh, in, in whether there's work to rest, whether there's power play, penalty kill, whether it's overtime. We're able to really get good baseline measures if we're looking at return to play for games. Yeah, so you're 100% correct. So I guess the way I think of it is practice is where you can make changes, yep. but having the game data gives you the context to make those changes. Because how do you know if you need to change practice if you don't know what's happening in a game? But it, on the same, on the, on the flip side of that is, can you imagine any sports scientist somewhere with an iPad pulling a head coach over and saying, "You need to actually rest this guy for thirty seconds longer"? Like that's not going to happen. Nope, I can't imagine that ever. <laughs> not anytime soon. <laughs> not not with the head coaches I've worked with. I can tell you that. Uh, so. Um, so that's the thing for me is you use it to impact training, to impact practices, to impact return to plays, to impact scratch players. But that only really comes into fruition when you have the context of game data. So true. And let me ask you, because I'm now I'm getting off tangent because, you, again, I have a bias here and tell me I'm wrong. But how important is actual context in interpreting these results? Like they're just numbers. Like if, if to me... There's a technical and tactical element of every team sport. And I think the weight training part's the easy part to train, right? That, that's low yeah. hanging fruit. You have to, again, bias. I'm not saying you have to play the game, by the way. I'm saying you have to have an understanding of the mm-hmm. game from the technical and tactical side 
to be able to put that data to life. Have you experienced that with the external load measures that, that, that you're taking? Yeah, so just I would just add on to that as well. Tactical and technical skills for me surpass gym ability, physical ability. Yeah. We can all point to certain players in the NHL who maybe yeah. aren't in the greatest shape but yeah. are phenomenal players. But outside of that, smart, smart, being intelligent, yep. sitting in for me, I love to sit in our video meetings and, and watch the, the sort of tactical plays and the system work being done. Sure. And that's given me this appreciation of how clever the players are. And somebody who is dumb is not going to be an elite hockey player because you, your game understanding needs to be on a whole nother level. And, and that again is, is you could be as fit as you want, but if you can't be in the right spots because you can't think that way, you're not going to be an elite player. But I, I'm going off on a tangent. No, no, there. no, no. I, and I and I have I've led you there, which is a, a good conversation to have. But from your experiencing with you know your external load monitoring, what are the metrics? And if you're able to share them, what what do you place value in, and why? So this is the crux of my PhD, and and I'll give you an example. So, because I, I did a talk for Catapult over the summer and, and my argument of my PhD is using singular metrics is outdated and shouldn't be done. And what we need to move towards is one number, but that number being a collection of important metrics. And I'll tell you for why. I, I have a slide that I used in, in the talk, two players. One of them had a player load. So for people that don't know, player load is the kind of all-encompassing metric that Catapult, the GPS company, generally hang their hat on. And they say, this is the one. It covers everything. It's, it's up, down, left, right, back, forward, everything, all rolled into one. Great, yep. simple metric. I had two players. One had a, a player load for a game of 247. One had a player load of a game of 249. So essentially, on the outside, you look at that and go, they did yep. the same thing. Yep. Okay. The difference was one was a defenseman who plays 27 minutes a night. One was a forward who plays nine minutes a night. One of them had double the amount of accelerations the other one did. One of them, in terms of a metric that we look at called high-intensity efforts, one of them had 18. The other one had one. So how can I make, because what I want to use this data for is for periodization, for planning, for making sure my players are adequately prepared. And if that I'm using one number and that one number is wildly flawed, what am I doing? I'm not preparing them appropriately. Sure. So yeah, the crux of the PhD is to find a more sensitive measure, a more reflective measure uh, of what's going on. And some of those metrics that we are looking at include a measure called explosive efforts, which yep. is a count measure of how many times an athlete moves at more than two meters per second. Uh, we look at high intensity work duration. So the systems will band like speed of movement. So, you know, mm -hmm. between zero and 0.0, three meters per second is a band one and 0.3 to 0.9 yeah. is band two or wherever they are. So we take those high band efforts and look at how much time people spend in those. And we look at things like force output per stride. So there's a lot of different metrics and, and I don't have the answer yet because I haven't finished my PhD, but the idea is we're going to do some statistical modeling and find out which one of these or which combination of these metrics is more sensitive. And how would you use this uh, in, from a periodized? I, I know you don't have that answer yet. I know that's what you're you're doing in your PhD. I'm going to ask you a little bit more of a targeted question. Again, this because the game is so complex and chaotic. Uh, I'm fond of saying this, and, and the listeners are probably going to say, "Oh gosh, here goes Donskov again." I love this quote. I gave it to Reg the other day in the podcast. I forget. I think it was Epictetus. No man has stepped in the same river twice, for he's not the same man. It's not the same river. If I were to put that metric on your forward or your defenseman, the next game. I'm not suggesting that would be drastically different, uh, but potentially there's a, a power play or an extra penalty kill or someone gets. Mm -hmm. My question is, if we're looking at bucketing a forward and a defenseman, is accurate just as good as 
precise, meaning am I hitting the bullseye around in, in, a, in, a, in an accurate area or does it have to be bullseye for each person? Can we use that information to periodize? Does that make sense? It, it does make sense. And, and uh, this comes up a lot when you start reading into the literature around the validity and reliability of GPS units yep. and the fact that people, you, you should... If you have a team of them, uh, you know, a team of players and, and a big box of these GPS units, that you want the same person to wear the same unit in the same place every single time. Sure. So that we're that we're getting that reproducibility. What I find is that one slice of time isn't usable, particularly for exactly that reason. Sure. So so a coach might come to me and say, Hey, what did this guy do in this period? It's like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> did he score a goal? Like, yeah. that's all I care about. Sure. It doesn't matter. But when you have 25 players wearing them across three practices a week and three games a week or across a whole season, now we can start to build up a generic picture. So yeah, we might, we might bucket our players into firstly into forwards and defense and goalies. Our goalies wear them as well. Sure. And then I might go, okay, so what, what does a top six forward look like against a bottom six forward? Mm -hmm. How does that change their relationship to their outputs based on their time on ice? Because yeah. that, for me, is something that opened, I, I got my eyes open to that earlier this year, which was everybody just assumes higher time on ice equals more work, therefore equals a higher yeah. workload and that's not true from what we've looked at so what we, what we found when we've broken it down to how much time on ice have people spent that doesn't necessarily match up nice and neatly to how much of work they've done so you can't use that as a sort of surrogate measure it could be a which, more intense shift or could be a, the, the, there you go absolutely yeah. if you're only playing six minutes every single one of those six minutes for a physiological and a psychological point of view are going to be intent. Because yeah. if you're a guy who only plays six minutes, your thought process is, well, I'm going to show you what I can do every single shift because I want to play more than six minutes. Sure. And equally, you have the physical capability to go all out. So I want to I follow up with a couple more questions here. I want to respect your time. What are two to three, maybe at the most, maybe one, aha moments that you have found pulling the hood back and looking at the engine, looking at the detail of the external workload that a trained coach's eye wouldn't see? <laughs> Good question. First one, controversial again. <laughs> morning skates. Okay. Let's talk about morning skates. Okay. One, of the, one of the projects I did at the end of my time with Red Star, at the end of the season, was I looked at how much accumulated work we had from our morning skates and we accumulated 12 additional gains worth of load across a season from our morning skates if you put that into the context of the charlie francis work of you need to be the super high or super low our morning skates neither though our morning skates right bang in the middle Everyone's kind of coasting around. What I'm saying is it's not enough to give us physical adaptation, but it's too much that it interferes with rest and recovery. It's a huge volume. What are we doing? Now, I will say that's from a physiological standpoint. Sure. And if there's a psychological reason and, and players want to do it, so I, I, I would never uh, tell a player not to do a morning skate. Never, so ever. So true. I, that, I love I loved what you just added there at the end. Absolutely. If that's their magic potion, you let that 100%. magic be. That's, that's your magic potion. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I would never, I never treat players like that. Sure. But if a coach, and I said this to our coach, I said, listen, I'm not telling you, I'm not the one that makes a decision on whether you want to skate or not. Thank God. But what I'm saying is, if you have that question in your mind, and you want to come to me and say, hey, Steve, should we morning skate or not? You don't need to come to me. You know what my answer is going to be. No, we don't. So that was one. That was one. Um, treatment of scratch players was, was another one. 
So, you know, that, and that, I guess, is very dependent on who the coaches are and how they're being treated and whatever. But one of the things that we're in GPS units allows us to do is we know exactly how much work that player would normally do in the game. And if they're not going to play, I know exactly how much work I need to do to get them to keep them topped up. Now, what we looked at was the way that we were conditioning our scratch players. Again, crunch the numbers. And we generally were somewhere between 51% of a game load to 97% of a game load. So one, that's a huge, huge amount of variety in there. Sure. And two, we aren't really doing them. We aren't keeping them conditioned. If that guy is scratched consistently over a year, we were kind of going in blindfolded, right? Mm -hmm. you, you're doing your best on, mm -hmm. and, and listen, this, we had great coaching staff, okay? And, and they have played a million percent more NHL games than I'll ever play. Yeah. But it, like you said, it's, it's everyone goes on their biases and sometimes those feels aren't right. So yeah, certainly that was one thing we looked at with Red Star was, sometimes those scratch skates weren't measuring up to what we wanted them to be measuring up to. So then that, once you have that information, you can then start going, okay, cool. And then the final one of the three was our return to play, how we yeah, work with so return true. to play athletes. Yeah. And honestly, it's a game changer, an absolute game changer. We had a player um, with a groin injury, was kind of rushed through this. This is Red Star. Um, was kind of rushed through through various pressures and whatever. Came back a little bit too early. Had another groin injury. Okay, at the point where we said, okay, listen, let's let's think of a different approach to this. Let's look at and and this is all anecdotal. I don't have evidence for this, but it was let's look at what they normally do in a practice before they got injured. Okay, from a from a workload standpoint, from a multi-model standpoint. When they come back, their first skate on ice, let's try and hit 50% of what they would traditionally do. And if they can tolerate that, great. Tomorrow, let's try and hit 60%. And we work up like this. And it's literally me in the stands watching the, the numbers go up. And when it gets to the point, saying to the coach, hey, that's good. Okay. And then for me, because somebody actually asked me this question the other day is, where do I draw the line to say that player is ready to go back? And for me, and again, it's completely anecdotally, but if they can hit three practices in a row where they're pretty close to what their average practice was before and they aren't getting pain, they aren't getting soreness, they aren't worried, that's the, that's the marker for me then. Okay, you're good to go back into, into practice. So, yeah. A, a very, very concise and targeted return to play program. Absolutely. Fantastic answers. Last question. So data analyzing your GPS system, obviously it depends. Um, I know the size of the staff matters, but in a small staff, I would imagine there's considerable time either tagging exercises or tagging drills looking at those numbers, data analyzing those numbers. And for every hour that you're doing that, you're not, you know, focusing on nutrition in the weight room, whatever it may be. Again, perfect world. Would there be an individual literally just doing data analysis for GPS? Or uh, I guess in a really, uh, you know, uh, if someone had a, a budget that was uh, not so great, uh, how much time would that, would that take? Uh -huh. I estimate I probably work 80 to 90 hours a week in this role. And, and when you say in this role, are we talking yeah. just analyzing the data? This is, no, this is, this is my, my role. So, so yeah. I do strength and conditioning. I do sports yeah. science. I yeah. do nutrition. So, but, but yeah, from, from either time spent at the rink or on a day off, day off, you know, the, adding those hours up, there's a wow. very, very large amount of work that gets done. So again, where am I going to fit my PhD? And I'm not really sure. So yeah, it, it is very, very labor intensive and time consuming. An ideal world for me 
and I don't want to upset anybody with how I say this. Yeah. I feel like there's a large scope and a range of practitioners out there from sports scientists who are very, very sports science. We all know these guys mm. and SNC coaches who are very, very SNC and don't want to look at you. And what you need to do is you need to find a middle ground. Personally, this is for me. You need to find a middle ground and you need to find two people. You need to find guys who understand and, and appreciate the application of SNC and data and how they marry together. And you need two of them. And in that way, because it's not just GPS analysis that I'm doing, right? I, I have the jump data and I have the walk rate data and everything else, heart rate that we have heart rate. So all the heart rate data. So yeah, there's a large percentage of my time spent analyzing that. But if you just sit in a room and analyze the numbers, you'd lose that understanding of what do these numbers mean? Absolutely. And so to people who can, who have the appreciation of both and can kind of have this symbiotic relationship um, was would be my ideal situation. Our guest today has been Steve Nightingale. Steve, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you very much for having me on. 